Father, this afternoon we sit at your feet. We are so privileged, O oh God, that you call us to just sit at your feet, that you would refresh us, you would strengthen us, you would speak to us, you would even rebuke us, God. We are so privileged that we have the opportunity to hear from you. And Father, this afternoon, we just surrender our hearts to you, O oh God. We empty our hearts of anything that may contend with the word of God. We empty ourselves of any issues of life that may hinder us from hearing what the Lord has for us today. We empty our hearts, O oh God, even about the plans we have for the afternoon that may hinder us, O oh God, from hearing what you have for us today. So, Father, we are coming with empty hearts that you would fill us afresh, that your word may be implanted in our hearts this afternoon, O oh God. May your word take root in our lives, that as we listen to your word this afternoon, that your word, O oh God, will start to germinate afresh because it will find fertile soil in our hearts, O oh God. So, Father, this afternoon we remove every form of heartedness that the enemy may bring in the name of Jesus. We silence every voice that is not of God, that may contend with the voice of God this afternoon. In the mighty name of Jesus, this afternoon, O oh God, we pray against every deception of evil, against every work of the enemy, every confusion of darkness, every work of the enemy to distract us from the word of God. And Lord, I give myself as a vessel, so unworthy, Lord, to be used of you. But I ask, oh God, for these few minutes that you have given me the opportunity to stand in front of your children, that every word that proceeds from my mouth will be under the instruction of the Spirit of God. And I pray, God Almighty, this afternoon, let the heavens be open to the working of Yahweh. Let the heavens be open to the working of Yahweh. Oh, let the heavens be open to the working of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Somebody lift up your voice to the Lord and lift up your hands to the Lord that you may receive from Yahweh this afternoon. Oh, Jesus, we ask of you. We ask of you, oh God. We ask of you, oh God. In this year, Lord, of beholding the glory of the Lord and putting us freshness, Master, in putting our strength, oh God, to behold the glory of the Lord. So, Father, this afternoon, we even put the sound under the command of the Spirit of God. That there will not be any form of interruption in Jesus' name. Even in the online church, we we'll speak to every gadget. And every, even our service provider, the internet, in the name of Jesus... We rise again as fluctuations in the mighty name of Jesus. And we pray, let the word of God go forth. Let the word go forth undistracted in Jesus' name. Father, we bless you and we honor you. For it is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. It is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Somebody say an amen if you believe that the Lord is here. Amen. You can have your seats. Tap your neighbor and tell them, welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. I want to appreciate the worship team. Daniel and your team, you've done an awesome job. Amen. There is a corner on my left. I didn't even know they exist. 
leo umechangamsha young professionals and specifically some who know themselves so we thank the lord for what he's doing among us and we thank you thank you worship team for ushering us so powerfully thank you james bernard for such a powerful prayer oh the lord is in this place if you're doubting it, it's probably because you came late to church. If you came a little early, uh, we've had a serious share of worship. So I pray that from next Sunday, we can't afford to be getting late to church. Just tell your neighbor, church starts at 10. Unajua aneza kuwa mesahau. Church starts at 10. Nairobi Chapel Imara, we have not changed the times. Our church service starts at 10 o'clock, not at 10.10, 10, not at 10.40. Just come and have a share of what the Lord is doing. Amen. We've been speaking about beholding the glory of the Lord. And what a privilege it is to have the servants of God come every Sunday to speak to us about beholding the glory of the Lord. I pray that you have been blessed. I pray that you have been blessed, and I know that the Lord is doing great and mighty things among us. This is the year where we will not just testify of the things that we can see or touch. This is our year of testifying of encounters with God. This is the year when we experience deep, because deep calls unto this is the year we experience God for ourselves. We are not going to experience the God of Pastor Lindsay. We are not going to experience the God of the pastors and the elders of this church. We are experiencing God for ourselves. Why? Because we are given to beholding the glory of the Lord. So I pray that your heart is thirsty to behold the glory of the Lord. I pray that your posture is right. Because what God is doing in this church, no man can fathom. Even our ears have not spoken about it. Elder Edu, we've not, we've not even put it in our targets. Because it's beyond our comprehension. The, the testimonies we are going to hear here, on this pulpit, ah, they are going to be testimonies of a people who have been with Jesus. They are not te testimony ya kupata gari ni ndogo sana. You can work hard for a car, my friend. You can work hard for a house. You can save. The testimonies that the Lord is going to splash out on this pulpit are not things that we can work hard for are not things that we can save and achieve. They are things that are only brought by people who have beheld the glory of the Lord. So I pray, it's only February, if you have not caught it, my brother catch it, my sister catch it, because the things that the Lord is doing, some of you who are listening to me today, the Lord will use you in your families. Some of our families are in bondage, including our parents. Some of our families do not know Jesus. But it's because of you who has given yourself to Jesus that our families will find freedom. Why? Because you gave yourself to behold the glory of the Lord. And so I pray with all my heart that we will catch what the Lord is doing. We will catch what the Lord is doing. As I prepared for this message, I have used too much tissue. Because my prayer was, oh God, oh God, oh God, may your children understand what it means to behold the glory of the Lord. In my tears, I have prayed that none of us will be distracted from the things that the Lord is doing. And I pray, because we, some of us have gone ear in, ear out, ear in, ear out, the biggest testimony you have is about the many years you're born again. 
my friend, it will not count this year. Because God is not looking for the number of years that you have been in salvation. There are people who will get saved this year and they will start prophesying. Because their hearts are given to Yahweh. There are people who will come from prostitution. People who will come from the dens of alcohol. And on this pulpit, they will declare the goodness of the Lord. The Lord will use them to heal men and women. Because their hearts are given to Yahweh. So don't give us how many years you're, you're born again. I know it's important. I know it's very important. But it's not as important as you giving your heart to Jesus. In Acts chapter 4 that we have read, the Bible talks about two people, Peter and John. And these two people that we see in the book of Acts chapter 4 were men who were given to Jesus. And as the chapter starts, we see these people preaching in the temple. And they are preaching a very unusual message that was not being preached in that day. Because the Jewish law did not believe in the resurrection. And they are here declaring that for you to be born again, you must believe in the resurrected Christ. And as they preach, the men of the cloth in the temple, the priests, the Sadducees and the leaders of the temple at that time became very uncomfortable with this message because it was not a message that was common. And the Bible records that when Peter and John were preaching in that temple, many people come, came to the saving grace of Jesus. Many people believed in Jesus. The Bible records 5,000 men who believed in Jesus Christ. When you just go back a bit in chapter 2, we see there were 3,000 men who actually gave their lives to Jesus. In just a day, just like that. 3,000 men. Can you imagine if 3,000 men just came to the saving knowledge of Jesus in this church? Where would we keep them? We'd have to ask the landlord for the parking. But we are getting there. Amen. So they preached the gospel. Many people came to the saving grace of God. Many people were converted from what they earlier believed. And now they are believing in a resurrection of Jesus. The opposition in the day did not stop the penetration of the gospel. The opposition did not stop the hearts of people from believing what God was doing. Amen. Tell your neighbor there is positive opposition. There is an opposition that brings fruit, my friend. Because the more the opposition in the early church, the more the people believed in Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people are believing in this Jesus. In Acts chap chapter 4, their number has been added to 5,000. And it is in an environment of opposition. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to remind you that opposition against the church can never even stop the gospel. Even opposition from politicians cannot stop the gospel. You know, when, 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 when the priests were coming against Peter and John, they had already buried Jesus at the time. They had crucified him. They had buried him. But what they did not know is that they did not bury the power. They only buried a body. But there was a power that arose and went even further than the ascension of Jesus. Even after the ascension, there was still power that remained. And that was the power that was making men and women believe in this saving grace of God. God is the God of the church. God is the God of the church. Even the kingdom of hell 
cannot prevail against the church. It cannot arise against the kingdom. Let me tell you, we have even seen the kingdom of hell try this church, but we have never closed down. Because there is a God of the church. And the Bible says that even that cannot prevail against the church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. So when you find opposition in your life, don't be quick to shun it. Some of the opposition that we face in our lives are just a catalyst for fruitfulness. In the name of Jesus, Peter and John were propelled by opposition. They were propelled by persecution. Amen. But my comfort is that, that when the enemy comes like a flood, the Lord again raises a standard. There is a standard that the Lord raises when the enemy starts shaking us. And so I pray that if you're under opposition today, may the Lord raise a standard in your life in Jesus' name. Regardless of where the opposition is coming from, whether it's coming from your workplace, whether it's coming from your family, wherever it's coming from, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise a standard. And some of the opposition that we face, the Lord will allow it. Because what matters to him is that standard. It's that standard. Amen. So Peter and John are now then presented before the high priest. They've gone through a lot. A lot of opposition has come their way. And so they are presented before the high priest and the rulers and all these elders of the church. And the reason why they were summoned is because these people in the church could not reconcile why these men are still doing the same things Jesus was doing. Yet they had buried, they had crucified and buried Jesus. And these men had the gut to go on. They had seen it happen. But they still were being propelled to do more and more. And so in verse 7, we see them asking Peter and John, by what power and by what name have you done this? Because they could not reconcile. Hallelujah. And in verse 8, the Bible says that Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. Peter had some boldness that only the Holy Spirit can give. I want to remind you that these are the very people who crucified Jesus. And Peter and John saw it happen. But because they were full of the Holy Spirit, they had an unusual boldness. They had an unusual strength to stand in front of people who you know can kill you and finish you. But in that boldness, they still recognize that the Jesus that you killed is the Jesus who has given us power. And this man that you crucified is the man that we are preaching about. And so the high priests and all the leaders realized that there was something unusual about these two men. There was something different about these men. I mean, their guts were amazing. They had too much guts because they knew the kind of people that they were speaking to were the kind of people who can mess up their lives, but they still spoke it in boldness. There was a lot of unusualness. But this is why the Bible says in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. 
and listened to this, and they realized that this man had been with Jesus. The unusualness that this man were exhibiting, the kind of guts that this man were exhibiting, were coming from a place where this man had been with Jesus. These men were not operating from a place of knowledge. You know, when the Bible records some small things, it's important to give attention to them. The Bible records that these men were untrained and uneducated. And scripture is trying to tell us here that these men were not relying on how much they knew because they had been taught about it. No, that was not their base of their boldness. This man's base of their boldness was a life that was lived with Jesus. This was the foundation of the reason why this man was speaking with so much courage, so much boldness, so much unusualness, yet they knew the kind of environment that they were in. This man had been with Jesus. And I know that even as we rolled out the theme for this year, that we have been speaking about beholding the glory of God. But I want to tell you, as our Sambaza time went, that God could be doing a work in this church and some of us will miss it. God could be taking, to a, could be taking us to a place where we are beholding the glory of the Lord and some of us will miss it. But the people who will get it, are those people who have been like Peter and John, they have been with Jesus. These are people who spend days and nights just thirsting for God, calling upon the name of the Lord. I want to say that this is a year of unusualness. If we are to behold the glory of the Lord, we have to get out of comfort zones and be willing to be led by Jesus. We have to get out of the normal seas of life and have an unusual thirst for God for us to behold the glory of the Lord. And you may be wondering, what is this beholding of the glory that you guys keep talking about? And I want to tell us, I wish you would all make it for our Explore service because 15 minutes of this sermon were explained in the Explore service. The Explore service starts every Sunday from 8.30 to 10 a.m. to 9.40, 8.30 to 9.40. Such a beautiful time to hear and understand what the Lord is doing. When we talk about beholding the glory of the Lord, it's coming to an encounter with the person of God, the person of Jesus, the person of the Holy Spirit. This is not an encounter with the God who does, but the God who is. Many times we chase after God because of the things that we need from him. You probably have been going through a financial mess and you're looking for God day and night because you want him to get out of that mess. But when we are beholding the glory of the Lord this year, that's not the priority of God because he can sort it out even before you ask. And the Bible says that in the book of Isaiah. But when we talk about beholding the glory, it's coming to that encounter with Jesus. Who he is, he reveals himself afresh to us. He reveals that I am who I say I am because we have beheld we have beheld the glory. We have been thirsty for God. And so he keeps revealing himself afresh every time. Beholding the glory of the Lord is where the presence of the Father becomes your dwelling place. This is the year when, when we call for a prayer meeting, you cannot miss it. Because you're thirsty for God. You must make time because you know what you want. And this church has every, I mean, we've given the opportunity for you to pray even during the, the midweek. You can make your way here on Wednesday evening. Come and pray. 
you can come early. This church is open every Sunday at 6.30 a.m. Because you're thirsty for God. You do not want to be left behind. The beholding the glory of the Lord is not a place of material miracles. This is just an output of what the Lord is doing in us. And he will do many things. He will do it. He will give you a wife. He will give you a husband. He will give you that car that you're asking for. He will give you that land. He will give you all the things that you desire of him. But when we talk about beholding the glory of the Lord, the priority of God is not the material things. When we talk about beholding the glory of the Lord, it's not about how good your gifting can be seen. I can be a good preacher. I, I pray that I am. I can be a good preacher. But unless my life is soaked in Jesus, that's the only way I can behold the glory of the Lord. It's not about how good my gifting is. It's not about how good your, your, your gifting is. But it's about a place of a life that is submitted and surrendered to be used by God. So we can rightly say that beholding the glory of the Lord is a matter of a lifestyle. Is who you are in the morning, is who you are in the afternoon, is who you are in the night. You are constantly beholding the glory of the Lord. It's not a Sunday affair. When you're doing your chores in the house, you are beholding the glory of the Lord. When you're serving in church, you're beholding the glory of the Lord. When you're in a matatu, you're beholding the glory of the Lord. When the storm is raging, when the mountains seem immovable, you are still beholding the glory of the Lord. Because the glory of the Lord is not a one-time affair. It is not seasonal. But, the, but beholding the glory of God can give you a season to carry you through all the seasons. Praise the Lord. And so that's our prayer this, this, this year. That we shall behold the glory of Yahweh. The difference in these two men was that they had beheld the glory. They understood the person of Jesus. They understood who he is. They wanted an encounter with Jesus. Do you remember? In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he told them, do not move from the upper room. I want you to stay where you are because I will send you help. And the reason why Jesus was telling them not to move from where they are is because even if you preach the gospel without the help of the Holy Spirit, it will not be impactful. But he asked them to stay in the upper room. To just wait on Jesus. And the Bible says that as they were waiting on the Lord, great power came upon them. And they began to speak in different tongues. There was a move of the Spirit. They were not in a hurry with God. They were not in a hurry to go to where they want to go. They were not in a hurry to go back to their children. They were not in a hurry to go back to their wives. And I'm not saying you stay in church and don't go back home. I'm saying that there is a place of encounter that you can get in. That time stands still. There is a place of encounter that you can come. That you can be in. That you lose sleep at 2 a.m. Because everything about yourself. Your body, your soul and your spirit. Have agreed that we need to chase after this God. And so my prayer, brethren, is that we will adjust to what the Lord wants us to adjust. So that we do not miss on what the Lord is doing. I pray that some of us here will just receive the boldness of Peter in Jesus' name. They will receive the boldness of Peter, regardless of your level of education. Regardless of the things you feel you have achieved or not. Because you have chosen to behold the glory of the Lord.
But there are a few things, there are a few things that can hinder us from getting to this place of beholding the glory. And I want us to be real in this segment. And as we speak, we probably would even have others that are not listed here. I want you to just soul search and ask yourself, what, it, what is it that I need to address? Because that thing is the one thing that will make you not behold the glory of the Lord. This atmosphere of beholding the glory of the Lord is an untainted atmosphere. The one thing that will hinder us from beholding the glory of the Lord is when we have a casual submission to Jesus. We say we are born again. We shout about it in the rooftops. But we are so casual in how we carry out our salvation. The Bible says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling because it's a serious thing. It's a high calling. And we see the disciples, Peter and John at this time, they took no chances in their dependence on God. They had not come to the place where they were so used to their gifting and what the Lord was doing until they were so casual about it. We see the disciples at that time, when they were released by the high priest, they ran back to their colleagues. They told them what had happened, and immediately they started praying. They did not rely on the miracles that they had already done. They did not rely on the boldness that they had. They didn't say that I have been used by God before. And so because I've been used by God before, he'll still use me. They knew that their lives depended on God wholeheartedly. And so they did not take chances in depending on the Savior. My friend, if you find yourself going for a day or two without reading your Bible, without prayer, you're being casual with Jesus. And you need to just come back to Jesus and tell the Lord, Lord, I want to depend on you fully. Because when your life is surrendered to God, something in you, when you're stepping out of the house, something in you will tell you there's something you've not done. It's like leaving your house without shoes. Would you leave your house without shoes? Would you leave your house without clothes? This congregation looks like they can pull a stunt. You're not responding to my question. Could you leave your house without clothes? You cannot because it's important to you. You want your physical body to be clothed. So why would you do a whole day, a whole day, without clothing yourself with this garment of Jesus? Yet you know your life depends 100% on it. Oh, I pray that the Lord will arise up people in Nairobi Chapel, Imara, whose hearts are given to the Lord, who are thirsty for the Lord, that they will not rest day and night until the purposes of the Lord are established. May you receive it if that is you, in Jesus' name. I pray that we shall not open our Bibles on Sunday morning. Some of us don't even open it before 10, 10, but before 10 a.m. We open it at 11 when the preacher says, open Acts chapter 4. That's when you remember, actually, like Old Testament, I'm a New Testament. Because you don't have a life that is dependent on God. And I'm not saying this to make anyone feel bad. I'm just saying that for us to get to the place of beholding the glory of the Lord, you must lose yourself and be so dependent on God that you will want to walk with the Lord in the day and in the night. And I know those days are there. There are times in where life can be very busy and you find yourself in one way or another, you probably skipped your devotion, but it should trouble you. It should trouble you to a place where in your lunch hour you will grab a verse or two. Because you do not want to go a whole day without just hearing, what are you saying, Lord? Don't depend on your pastors to hear from you. 
Because you can hear God for yourself. We are just your support system to help you know what the Lord is saying. But it should come from a place I keep saying. That the reason why we are, saying, we are seeing so many Christians, so many Christians come to that place where they are running for prophetic miracles is because you're lazy. We are lazy Christians who are not reading the Bible for ourselves. We are there, kitengela, ata matatu ikipandishwa, uko tu. And the other places that you know you go. But I want to bring to us a Jesus who is very personal. A Jesus who can hear you wherever you are. A Jesus who is available for you, my brother. That when you give your life and dependent on him, he will speak to you. Praise the Lord. And the spirit of God is just a good spirit of God. He is available. And we realize that the disciples in disaster, I say that they were undergoing persecution. And even then, they found time for, time for Jesus. We cannot live lives that are devoid of prayer and studying the word. I pray that we will set our minds and our schedules to chase after God. As you just look through what you're doing for the day, set your time with the Lord. Set your time with the Lord and you will see an evidence of his power. Amen. The second thing that will make us not get to that place is when we allow distractions to come our way. And these distractions make us lose focus. Remember your desire is that you behold the glory of the Lord. And as you make that your desire, I want you to know that you have an enemy. And this enemy will bring anything your way to make you not get to where the Lord wants you to get. And many times distractions are a very subtle attack of the enemy, even in the church. Sometimes we plan we'll be doing prayers from this time to this time. But kidogo kidogo too, you find that's the day your child decides to disturb more than ever. That's the day you decide. I mean, there are too many things that come our way. I pray that this year we shall be people who are focused on what we have, on what the Lord is speaking to us. And this is mainly an attack of the enemy to every Christian distractions and he introduces the enemy introduces distractions that you cannot quite call sin they just look okay they look normal they look like things um, we can live with but they're actually distracting you from encountering God and in 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 the Bible says that the devil masquerades as an angel of light he comes clothed as good but he's deceiving you. There's a spirit of deception that fights against the children of God so that they do not behold the glory of the Lord. You have to be alert to the schemes of the enemy. And you will find the day you decide to wake up very early. You know, I realized a few weeks ago, just this year, I, I like pr having my prayer time very early in the morning. And just half an hour before, or an hour before, is when my daughter will wake up. And at that time, the cry that will be in that house, I cannot even pray because I have to attend to her. I remember I shared it with Pastor Ben the other day. Because if she wakes up at 1 a.m., now what time will I even pray? And by the time she goes back to sleep, it's 4 a.m., so I can't even pray. But she was not like that until recently. So I realized this, this, just, this is just a distraction of the enemy. And I remember in our home devotion, we prayed about it. And we prayed that God remove distractions from our prayer lives. And I thank the Lord because God just chased like him. I'm totally alala squeezy. And at least I can wake up and pray. 
I'm just saying this to tell you that the enemy is unrelenting. He will pass through anything and anyone to make you distracted from that focus of beholding the glory of the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom to devour. If he did it for Jesus, who are you? The Bible says that after 40 days of Jesus being in the wilderness and in prayer, the devil came and tempted him three times. He could not succeed. But the Bible says that he went until an opportune time. That means that the devil is always looking for an opportunity to distract you, my sister. And he will go through anything and anyone. Anything and anyone. You have to keep your focus right. You have to know that this is my time of prayer. Father, energize me. Strengthen me. Amen. Is there a person who is willing to be undistracted this year? The third hindrance to you manifesting the glory of the Lord is pride. Every one of us has a level of pride. We are very human. Pride is a spirit. It's a very subtle way that the enemy uses. I honestly get jazzed when I hear of someone who says, me, I'm not proud. Because honestly, that first is the first thing that tells us you're very proud. What happens with pride is that it's a spirit that the enemy uses. And the reason why it's a spirit is because we talked about beholding the glory of the Lord, being an atmosphere of the presence of the Lord. Pride puts a blind to our eyes. It hinders you from seeing what God is saying and even seeing what God is saying about you yourself. It's a veil. Do you see when brides are walking down the aisle, they have this veil? That's exactly what the enemy does. He uses the deception of pride to rise against the believers. And this spirit of pride is not even shy to anointing. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. What a great man and woman of God. I have read of great men and women of God who did big things in their time. I read about one in Nigeria. Aye. Big things for God, but pride. The only way to counter the spirit of pride is when you're submitted to Jesus. Because pride is an enemy. It will attack you every day. It will hinder you from beholding the glory of the Lord. And this is, these are a few things that make you know you, you, you need to deal with that issue of pride. When you find yourself feeling you're, you're so above everybody else, watch and pray, my sister. That's, that's just something to tell you. Watch and when you feel your office cannot operate without you. By the way, it is, it is okay to have more knowledge than others. But why don't you use that knowledge to help others get to where you are? Praise God. Instead of seeing other people are less than you, why don't you use it to help other people get to where you are? If you feel, by the way, that you're somewhere. When you find yourself correcting everything and everybody, you come to church, you don't even serve. You're talking about how the stairs are, where we need to paint blue instead of cream. You just correct everything. There is a spirit you need to deal with, my sister and my brother. And this spirit will make you not behold the glory of the Lord. By the way, it's not to say that we did not see blue when we were choosing colors. We even saw yellow. You, and you're wondering, this worship team has to wear yellow. Kwanza one has a yellow that doesn't look like yellow. Like a spirit that the enemy just comes and creeps in to the church. 
And that is the fall of every Christian. You will find yourself going down because you felt above than everybody else. And there is a man in 2 Kings chapter 5, a man called Naaman. A man who almost missed on beholding this glory of the Lord. The Bible says that Naaman was a big man in Aram. He was a commander of the army, such a big man. A very respectable man. But he had an issue. He had leprosy. And God being God, used a servant girl to tell him of where to find his healing. And he was directed to a prophet. But because Naaman was a big man, he went to the king of Aram. And the king wrote a letter to the king of Israel. And this was how the king wrote the letter. He said, I'm sending my servant Naaman that you may heal him. Remember the instruction was going to a prophet, not to a king. And Naaman went to the king. But the king could not heal Naaman. Because he did not have that grace. And the king told him about a prophet. And the prophet got to know about it. The prophet Elisha. And the prophet invited Naaman. He said, let that man come to my house. And when Naaman went to the house of Elisha, remember he's a big man. Remember he is probably coming with, you know when these big men are coming, we have to reserve like four rows because one man will come with like 20 people to, to protect them for security. So I can only imagine that Naaman was walking in that way. He was walking with many, I mean, there were so many people who were, who were with him. And the Bible says that when he got to the house of Elisha, Elisha did not come out of his house. Elisha actually told the servant, go and tell Naaman to go and bathe in the Jordan seven times. Now, there are two things here. Number one, you don't come and see me. I'm a big man. You should be the one coming to address me, not your servant. Then you're telling me to go to a jo the Jordan River was a very dirty river. He even started giving options. Can I go to river? Can I go to river? Because he's feeling a man of my stature cannot go to where you want me to go. But he the instruction was you have to go to river Jordan and bathe there seven times. Until his servants are the ones who are telling him, I boss, you know this guy is a prophet. So you just obey him. And finally he went. Pride. The man had pride. But by the grace of God, he, he, he got it. And he went to the Jordan River. And he was healed. And sometimes we are like Naaman. We are that place where we feel we are somebody's. And sometimes by the way we are not even somebody's. It's just pride. Yani, ulizaliwa nayo. Huh? And you just start moving with pride. It will make you not behold the glory of the Lord. And if you're that person, the Lord is so gracious. He can turn it around in Jesus' name. The fourth thing is the state of your heart. Oh, the state of your heart. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 tells us, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. This heart, and it's not the physical heart that we are talking about, this heart determines the course of your life. This heart is the engine of your life. That's why the Bible tells you to guard your heart. There are versions that say, for out of it comes the issues of life. We have in this year of beholding the glory of the Lord, and it's not, a just, it's not just a this year thing, it's going forward, that we will ask the Lord to empty our hearts of things that will hinder us from beholding the glory of the Lord. The bitterness, the anger, the unforgiveness, 
or even the malice. So many things that we put in our hearts that will hinder the, an encounter with Jesus. You know, God does not share his glory with anything. He will not share his glory even with bitterness and anger. You have to get rid of it for you to behold the glory of the Lord. It cannot continue being a stumbling block. Some of the things that we are suffering from are things that if we rid ourselves from it, there's a lot of freedom in an empty heart. So I pray that in this season, the Lord will empty our hearts of the things that we have held on to that are threatening even the peace of our hearts. Amen. That neighbor, that child, that family member, Please unclog your heart. Travel light. Unclog your heart. Because every time your heart is clogged, it's very difficult to pray. It's very difficult to be in the presence of the Lord. And you will miss out on an encounter. The fifth thing is carrying your past into your present and the future. This past, can it remain in the past? And we say that the present is present. In John chapter 5, there was a man who had been lame and seated on the gate of Bethsaida. For 38 years, this man had been there. And Jesus passes through the gate and asks this man, would you like to get well? And instead of this man answering yes or no, the man starts, starts recounting that, you know, Jesus, I have been wanting to get into this uh, pool of water. But every time I want to get, there is no one to push me. He kept on referring to his past experience. And Jesus is here. Jesus is asking him, would you like to get well? You think Jesus didn't know? Jesus knew. But he is here, ready and willing to heal. But this man is talking about his past and the experiences of his past, and the things that have happened to him in his past. And some of us are like this lame man who was seated on the pool of Bethsaida. Every time we are referring to the past, the things that were done to you in the past are the past. And I'm not saying, I'm not disregarding the issues of the past, but I'm saying that it is time you deal with your past for you to behold the glory of the Lord. Whatever your parents did or did not do remains in the past. The Lord has given you the knowledge of himself for you to be free. Can we seize from the past? That boyfriend who ditched you, could you even be glad that he ditched you? Because 10 years down, he will not even be what he wanted. Praise the Lord. Ask this one who are married. Oh, my wife. Because the past must remain in the, in the past. We have to behold the glory of the Lord. Somebody must say that I will not move until the Lord changes my heart concerning the past. And I know some of the things are very deep. Some things are even coming from your childhood. Child of God, you must find help to whatever it is. Because we must behold the glory of the Lord. The final thing that will make us not behold the glory of the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 the Bible says what relationship does light have with darkness? And if you're living a life, a life of sin it is time to just turn around to the Savior. It's just time to say that, Lord, I want to live my life in righteousness. I want to live my life in holiness. Because that is the only channel of beholding the glory of the Lord. I say that the glory of the Lord is a very jealous atmosphere for the Lord. He does not share it with anything. And so those two cannot be in fellowship light cannot be in fellowship with darkness. You must separate yourself from sin. And I know we are living in modern day Christianity where there is even a subtle way of telling of sin. 
sin remains sin. What the Bible calls sin is sin. Lying is sin. You know, many times we cloud many things. Ati nilikuwa tu na jaribu kunavigate. My friend, it's called lying. Don't use too many words. Lying is actually simpler from navigating. We have to be very intentional to live lives that are righteous and lives that are reflecting this glory of the Lord. And I know that as I have spoken about the many pointers, and I don't know, I, I, I know I have not exhausted them. And as we continue speaking about this, a lot will come out clear. But I pray that none of those things will hinder you from what the Lord is doing. And if you are that place where you feel there is something that is hindering, it's time to address it. And the beauty about Jesus is that he is a God who turns around destinies. Whatever the enemy meant for evil, he turns it around for your good. If you're struggling with sin, this girl here is a testament of the grace of God at work. I was wayward. I don't talk about it. Because if I do, you, I, don't even, I, do, I actually don't qualify to be a pastor. It's the grace of the Lord. Because the many things I did are nothing to go by. So I want to encourage you. If you're living a life of sin, the Lord can turn it around in Jesus' name. You must behold the glory of the Lord. There needs to be something in your heart that is bubbling every day that I must behold the glory of the Lord. Every day, your prayer should be, Father, as I start this day, would I behold the glory of the Lord? May I behold the glory of the Lord in my workplace. May I behold the glory of the Lord in my business. May this life be a reflection of the glory of the Lord. Like Peter and John, I pray that we shall be people who, people look at you and they see this man has been with Jesus. The way you operate in your office is not normal. Pastor Ben told us, even our dressing must be all the glory of the Lord. Because light has nothing to do with darkness. And we are not talking about dressing in church. We are talking about a lifestyle. Your dressing on Monday is the same as your dressing on Sunday. I'm not saying that you wear long things every time. But I'm saying that there needs to be something that people look at you and they see a difference in you. We need people to come into this church, but they live in your neighborhoods. How are you in your neighborhood? Are you the person who causes commotion in every meeting in your neighborhood? You're the one who talks the most. I know, by the way, you're gifted in human rights. Lakini si uongeze Yesu. Si uongeze tu Yesu. You stand up and you tell them, my friends, in gentleness, in love, because that is the only way the world will know this Jesus. We must be a reflection of this God. And I pray that each of us, under the sound of my voice, will have a desire to be like Peter and John. And the Bible says that they were full of the Spirit. That means it's possible for you to have a boldness, even in that meeting, to speak full of the Spirit of God. That's my desire today. That we shall not just be Christians in Nairobi Chapel, Imara. The Bible says that the eyes of the, of the Lord are roaming, looking for a heart that is given to Yahweh. Just a heart given to the Lord. You don't need to know too many Bible verses. You do not need to pray for one hour. You will get there. You just need to have a heart given to the Lord. I'd like us to stand. Hallelujah. This God is available. This God is available. And you probably are here. And as we speak about the glory of the Lord, you cannot even relate to it. Because you've never given your life to Jesus. 
What a good opportunity it is for you to just come and just surrender your life to the Savior. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. And if you're there and you would like to give your life to Jesus, you, will, you want to start experiencing this God at a deeper level, I'd like you to raise your hand. I'd like you to raise your hand and so that we can know that you're there and we pray with you. I'd like you to raise your hand in surrender. Raising your hand in surrender. Praise the name of Jesus. I see a hand. Are you there? And you want to give your life to Jesus. You want to say no to sin. And you want to experience this glory of the Lord. Are you there? My sister, I request you to come to the front. Just come to the front so that we pray with you. Are you there? We do, not want, we do not want to leave anyone out. You probably gave your life to Jesus so many years ago. But probably you have not walked right. It starts there. And this is not just a parade of shame. It's a surrender to the Savior. Saying that God, I am standing before your children. Surrendering my life to you. That you may lead me. Are you there? Are you there and you'd like to give your life to Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is here and he is available for us. I'll ask Elder Edu to come and pray with her. And I want to pray for another people. You have heard of the many things that hinder you from experiencing the Lord. And this is a moment where you're saying, I'm carrying so much in my heart. I am carrying the past into my future. But by this, on this Sunday, I make a decision to empty my heart. Because I want to have an encounter with Jesus. I want to behold the glory of the Lord. Are you there? Are you there? And this is your opportunity to just rid yourself of anything. Could it be a heart issue? Could it be you're so casual with God? And you just want to make it right with him. I just want every eye closed and praying and seeking the Lord. Even if you're not in that category, you must chase after God. And none of us has achieved it. It's a constant submission to the Savior. It's a constant submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Are you there? Are you there and you want us to pray together? Are you there and you want us to pray together? Maybe so many things happen to you. Maybe in your childhood or whenever. But this is an opportunity for you to empty your heart and to make it right so that the Lord can find a place in your heart. Are you there? And we are here available to pray with you. Just raise your hand if you're there for us to pray together. Hallelujah. Father, we bless your name this afternoon. We thank you, God, because your words has an environment of richness. There is no empty ground in your word, O oh God. And Father, just like Peter and John, you're calling us to be men and women who are full of Jesus. That the world can look at us and they will desire Jesus because there is a uniqueness we exhibit that they can desire you. So Lord, I pray this afternoon that every person, Lord, who has listened to this message, whether online or in the sanctuary today, I pray that our lives shall not be the same again. I pray that God Almighty, we shall be people who are chasing after you. I pray that the Spirit of God will bring conviction in our hearts, oh God. Whatever we need to deal with, oh, I pray, let this be the opportunity where we deal with these things so that we do not miss out, Lord, on what you're doing in the church. Help us, God. Help us, Jesus, that we shall be those men full of the Spirit of God, 
full of boldness that the Lord will look at us and find pleasure in our lives that the Lord will look at us and trust us because we have chased after God so I pray this afternoon that every person will be re-energized to behold the glory of the Lord hallelujah